All right, open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy 1, if you don't have a traditional Bible and you'd like one, please go to the Welcome Center before you go. We'd love to give you one of those as a gift. In the meantime, we'd really love it if you'd use the YouVersion app. It's also called the Bible app. We've already uploaded all the notes and all the scriptures. If you don't have that app on your device, you can scan this QR code and it'll take you there. If you're watching us online, we got people right now from Southeast Asia, from Eastern Europe, from Canada, from California, from Detroit, its own country of its own. And so we love you guys and we're so grateful to my friend Jamie. Shout out Jamie. He texted, emailed me already. He holds that online thing down. And so thank you. He's doing it from Minneapolis today and uh, super grateful for all of you guys being a part of our family and really grateful for you guys on the Cardinal Sunday that you would be here today. And uh, I love Pastor Dallas message last week. His Arnold impersonation was spot on. I was like, what if he had done the entire message? It made me watch the movie Commando this week. Actually watch the Arnold movie <laughs> Commando this week. I didn't even know that was in his repertoire, but his best line was when he said that every part of the armor of God points back to the word. So good. Uh, I've gotten uh, quite a few messages this week from people talking about how creepy that trailer is. Like it's the kind of thing that'll give you nightmares. And I thought, good, mission accomplished because actually there's some things that you're allowing in your lives and in the lives of your kids that gives me nightmares. Well, I'm gonna be in it today. I've been gone a minute, so I'm, I, came, I came full for bear. And so, because this, this idea of spiritual warfare, it is no joke. And so I wanna keep talking about it this week in a message that we're calling, You're Under Attack. Let's pray. God, we love you, thank you for your word. Let it become life, God. Let our words shrink and your word grow, God. Let us leave this place less like us and more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, quite frankly, there are some things that I do not want to see, uh, like people getting injured, particularly people breaking a bone, uh, because I've been up close to it. When we're in college, many of you don't know this about Pastor Sonny, but Pastor Sonny in her former life used to be the South Dakota State women's arm wrestling champion. And so in school, uh, they had a pep rally and uh, the athletic director organized for Pastor Sonny to run an arm wrestling tournament. And so, I mean, we had the table, the whole thing, the arm grips, the whole thing. It was like Sylvester Stallone and over the top, backwards hats, the whole thing. And so there was one guy who just kept winning. He was whipping everybody, his name was Steve. And Steve was killing everybody. Nobody could beat Steve. Steve at the time, was benching over 500 pounds. And so it was person after person after person, they'd come out, Steve would put him down, put him down, put him down, put him down. There's another cat in the crowd named Bob and Bob also benched over 500 pounds. And so people started to murmur for Bob to get out the crowd and get in the game. And people started chanting, Bob, 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 Bob. And so I was like, Bob. But now I'm playing. So, they're, so Bob finally comes down. He's from Rifle, Colorado. You got to be a bad to be from Rifle, Colorado. And so he comes down and they lock up and Pastor Sonny is the judge. And I'm standing there watching. I'm real close because I'm a plus one. And so Steve's got the BMX grip and Bob's got the BMX grip and they lock arms and it's a stalemate. And it's a stalemate. And they're frozen in time. It's, it's like Clash of the Titans. Nobody's moving. Steve gets an idea that maybe he should put his hips into it. And so Steve starts like this. And he starts rocking his body. He's going to rock that body. So he, he, like, he starts cranking. And as he starts moving Bob's arm, I hear and Steve's arm right here, Steve, the one who was winning, it popped and it went and circled around. And Steve went white. <gasps> and for two years, Steve couldn't lift anything heavier than a milk jug because they had to, he spiral broke his arm and they had to cut a piece of his bone out and they put in metal and they screwed it all back together. So every time I see an injury, I can't handle it. I just, I don't wanna, I don't wanna see it because I've been up close to it. There's also some things I don't wanna hear or I don't wanna talk about, like demonic stuff. 
it, it, to me, it's like telling ghost stories. It drums something up in me because I've seen it. I've been up close to it. I was at a church one time, Kojic Church, Church of God in Christ. They get crazy in Church of God in Christ churches. If you don't feel saved in a Church of God in Christ church, you need to go home. So about two hours in, <laughs> this guy, this guy named Rahim, stands up in the crowd and starts manifesting. And he's like 6'4", 275 pounds. He's, he was a member of what's called YBI, Young Boys Incorporated. It was a huge gang in Detroit, and he was an enforcer for them. And he starts to manifest. And that church back then had security, like, you know, churches have security now. And so uh, security kind of descended upon him and, you know, try to, try to take him out to church. And, and Rahim wasn't having it. So Rahim, he looked, he looked like Neo in Matrix. Like they were on top of him. He said, rah! Like he literally roared and cats like fell backwards. And guys were trying to get on him. And Rahim was like pushing people down. And he wasn't, he wasn't having it, man. And Sister Shreve, whose brother was an old wrestler named Abdullah the Butcher. Sister Shreve took her shoe off. She said, in the name of Jesus, and she hit Rahim upside the head with her shoe, and he fell out. And he got up, and his name was different. His name was Fahim. And everybody who had ever met him called him Rahim, but they hadn't met Fahim. They met the demon that was inside Rahim that made him have this superhuman strength. It was crazy. It was crazy. You had to have been there. I was overseas at a revival meeting and this guy was preaching. And while he was preaching, this guy in the crowd freaks out. He stands up in the crowd, yells something in a different language. I think he was talking about the speaker's mama. He got up, said something crazy, ran full speed at the back wall, hit that back wall like he was Peter Parker out of disguise. He climbed up the side of the wall. I was tripping. He looked like that cat in the movie Switch, if you've ever seen that. Which, by the way, isn't a movie about mental health. It is a movie about demonic possession. That guy in that movie was possessed. I don't know what it is about our culture that we love to dabble in the demonic. But thinking you can control a demon is like thinking you can control a tiger. They're cooperative till they get hungry. And it is especially prevalent this time of year. So many ghouls and ghosts and goblins. Uh-uh, nope. You think I'm going to go to a haunted house? Or I'm going to go to a haunted trail? Nah, player, the devil is a liar. I'm trying to close the door on the demonic. I'm not trying to open it. That trailer and this series is as scary as I want to get. Because again, there are some things I don't want to hear about or talk about because I've seen it and been up close to it. But I have to talk about it because some of you haven't had the kind of experiences I've had that would let you know that you and your family, you're under attack. And so, so we've been planning this series for a couple of months. And so I've debated the past couple of months what I wanted to talk about the next couple of weeks. Like I was going to talk to you about the levels of the demonic, that, that, there, that there is a hierarchy. There are principalities, there are powers, there are rulers of the darkness of this world, and then there is spiritual wickedness in the high places. I'm going to talk to you about the fact that there are local, regional, national, and international rulers. Like, like there's a demonic authority that has been attached and assigned to Green Bay, Wisconsin. And he will attack this city with whatever will draw us away from God. Whether that be alcohol, whether that be a passion for something that's not God, whether that be religion, there is a religious spirit over this town, not a, not a Jesus spirit, but a religious spirit that makes people who aren't going to heaven think that they are. And these regional, national, and international demonic forces, they are constantly jostling. They are constantly fighting for positions and for promotions. Like the, the demonic force that is over Green Bay would love to be over Wisconsin. He would, he would love to be over America. He would love to be the, the prince over top of North America. So they're constantly jostling. They're constantly fighting, not just you, but fighting each other. I was going to talk to you about how some theologians believe that there is an unholy trinity that is an inversion of the holy trinity. 
that Satan, the father of lies, is in opposition to God, the father, that Lucifer, the light bearer, is in opposition to the son, Jesus, who's the light of the world, and that Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies, is the inversion of the Holy Spirit, the dove. I was gonna to talk to you about how there are specific demons tasked with specific sins or struggles and that they vary in strength, that, that, that within demonology, which is the study of demons, uh, it is widely accepted that sexual demons are the strongest demonic force. Uh, but, but, but then I thought that maybe that depends upon your environment, that, that I'm not sure that that's as true in parts of the Middle East as it is here in America where we are this overtly sexual culture. In fact, it's one of the reasons why people in the Middle East are so anti-America. Because with the power of the internet, we have infected the planet with our perversions. See, I actually think that demonic forces are actually drawn to your temptations and then they magnify those temptations. That they identify and magnify. But what if you identified your weaknesses and you owned them before demonic forces identified them and owned you? It's why the enemy hates accountability and he tries with everything in his power to keep us from submitting ourselves to it. But, but what, if you put, what if you put them out there like, like if there's a substance that you're struggling with, say it. If, if there's a woman or a man who, who you find tempting, tell someone and ask that person to watch you when you're around that person. Because attraction isn't a sin, action is. Accountability helps us to avoid that action. But, but when we struggle in silence, we're inviting sin into our lives. We're, we're acting like we're either immune to attack or we're not under attack. Like there isn't an enemy that's prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone whom he can devour. And the enemy loves that. In fact, Father Gabriel Amorth, chief exorcist of the Vatican from 1986 to 2016, who is said to have performed over 30,000 documented exorcisms, which he says involved more than 160,000 demons, said when we jeer at the devil and tell ourselves he doesn't exist, that is when the enemy is happiest. But there is an enemy. He does hate you. He does want to destroy you. He does want every area of your life to be upended. And he's constantly plotting your destruction and your demise. So I thought, why don't I start my package of messages in this series with a sort of public service announcement. Uh, a message from the emergency broadcasting system. Because this is not a test. You are under attack. So let me give you three ways to know how. I thought I didn't want to just give you information. There's, there's lots of stuff that I know that you would think is cool. Lots of like, like any of those things. We could have gone into any of those things and it would have been like, oh man. Listen, I don't want you to leave here knowing more about demons. I want you to leave here knowing how to beat them. They're trying to kill you. They hate you. They're everywhere. They're swirling. I read this uh, series of books back in the day when I was a new believer by Frank Peretti. This present darkness, piercing the darkness. Like they, they are so descriptive in, in the demon thing that I, and I, actually, I actually had to put them down because they were stirring up some old struggles that I had. I used to be a, like a big avid Stephen King book reader and I'll talk more about that uh, during this series. But the books are Christian. They were so graphic that I thought if Hollywood ever made these books into a movie, they could never show them in public. And so uh, I wanted to be practical. So I wanted to show you how you're under attack and uh, let you know that they, that they escalate in intensity, the attacks, okay? Here's the first, is temptation. If you are feeling tempted, you are under attack. Now, temptation isn't a sin, but it is a sign. Uh, but too many of us ignore it or we're embarrassed about it, which empowers it. T temptation almost always happens in isolation. Uh, just look at Jesus. He was in isolation in the desert. And when he was in isolation, the enemy attacked. And, and Jesus was only able to defeat the enemy's temptation because he understood a truth that you need to understand, that isolation and being alone are different things. 
Because Jesus wasn't actually alone. He was in the presence of his Father and his Helper, the Holy Spirit. He, he spent consistent time with them every day, letting them deposit the tools that he'd need when he ultimately would have to face this temptation head on. What is it that you're consistently depositing into you? Uh, James, uh, the brother of Jesus, said, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Here's what's interesting. I can't police your temptations and you can't police mine because you are tempted by things I'm not tempted by and I am tempted by things you're not. Most of the things that you're tempted by, I don't know you're tempted by them. And most of the things that I'm tempted by, you don't know that I'm tempted by them. Why? Because we are tempted in isolation. So every person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. I wonder, what have you allowed to be conceived in you that you're carrying in your womb spiritually that you are inevitably going to give birth to. See, the enemy is strategic and he's systematic. For example, if you're allowing yourself to watch porn, conception, then when that guy or that girl at your job starts giving off vibes or when you get a, a DM on social gestation, those two things are most likely to give birth to infidelity because it is the law of diminishing returns. Yesterday's thrill becomes tomorrow's habit because the enemy is strategic, he's systematic, and the first wave of his attack is temptation, which we, which we defeat with identification. Identify it and nullify it. What are you tempted by? Tell somebody. The second way to know that you're under attack is through condemnation. And this happens when you've faced temptation and given in. And so now the enemy starts speaking death over you, telling you that it's too late, telling you that you've already crossed the line, telling you that there's no turning back, telling you that you're a low down, dirty, good for nothing piece of trash, that you can't pray, you're a blank, or God won't forgive you, you're filthy, you're foul, you're a failure. Then when he's spoken that over you and that seed has been planted into your spirit, he'll start giving you excuses to keep you incarcerated. And you'll start saying things like, well, my dad was a blank, so I'm always going to be a blank. Or, or, well, you know, you were born that way. Or, or, or you know, oh, that's, oh, that's not an addiction. That's a sickness. That's a disease. And once you start making excuses, you're going to start making plans. And rather than admitting your struggles, you'll start submitting to them. But your sin doesn't need to create separation. The book of Romans says, for I am convinced. That neither death nor life, angels or demons, the present, the future, the power, the height, the depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin doesn't have to create separation between you and God or between you and others. But you have to, have to, have to bring it to light. The book of James says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be Healed, the prayer of a righteous. Righteous just means in good standing. The prayer of a person who's in good standing with God is powerful and it is effective. Guys, confession is the cure and it is good for the soul. Now, will there be consequences? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But the short-term consequences you'll have to face from confession are far better than the long-term consequences you'll have to pay for giving in to condemnation and living in silent sin. If you're feeling condemnation, you're under attack from a strategic, systematic enemy whose second wave is condemnation, which we defeat with confession. Confess it and conquer it. The third way to know you're under attack is intimidation. And I believe that this is the most intense because intimidation doesn't just cause fear in the people of God. It causes silence because the enemy makes us believe that he will bring upon us 
exactly what he's afraid we'll bring upon him, which is exposure. When you have hidden sin in your life, the thing you fear most is that your sin will be exposed. Listen, if your spouse is hiding their phone, you better call somebody. Something's happening. I leave my phone everywhere. I didn't used to leave my phone everywhere. I used to get nervous if somebody had my phone. Hey, who got my phone? Hey. Hey, where my phone? Hey, where my phone at? Hey, hey, have three passwords on it, cause I was hiding stuff. I used to get scared if somebody got to the house and got the mail first. I used to get mad, scared if somebody had my bank login, if somebody could see this statement on the bank, cause I didn't want them to know what I was spending my money on. If you got a relationship with somebody and they are hiding something, there is a sin symptom right there. And so the enemy, he, he, he wants you to feel intimidated by the fact that he's, he's going to put you out there. He, he'll, he'll make us think we're too filthy to be forthright. And he's done this so powerfully in the church today by making us reclassify sins as issues. And so because of that in the church, we don't talk about things that we blatantly know are in opposition to God or his word, and we unknowingly endorse those things. And we do that because we are afraid we might offend somebody. But let me ask you a very practical question. Why are we more afraid of offending others than we are about offending God? Friends, when you start calling sins issues, you know you're under attack from a spirit of intimidation. And you overcome the spirit of intimidation with authority because God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity. Watch this. But he has given us the spirit of power. Watch the language, comma, and of love, comma, and of a sound mind. The Trinity of God has given us the Trinity of defense, the trifecta. And by giving you the spirits of power and of love and of a sound mind, he has given you authority. So when the enemy attacks your kids at school by trying to teach them sinful, unbiblical things, you take authority by teaching your kids the truth of what scripture actually says. You take authority by meeting with the teacher to communicate with that teacher the truth that you teach at the house that you're not going to tolerate on the outside world. You, you give your kids authority by giving them permission to disagree. You take authority by going to the school board meeting. You take authority by running for school board. When people try to push their sinful, ungodly agenda upon you, you recognize it as an attack of the enemy and you take authority. You stand on and you speak out the word of God because the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even as far as the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It exposes, come on somebody, it sifts, it analyzes, it judges the very thoughts, the very purposes and the very intentions of the heart, your heart and the hearts of others. See, God's word is the defining and the dividing line. You can say whatever you want, but actions speak louder than words. The scripture is the defining and the dividing line and it gives you authority. Authority that you can take, I'm about to get up in your mouth, Authority that you can take, incidentally, in a couple weeks at the polls. Now, listen, Jack, I never, can I repeat and put in all capital letters, N-E-V-E-R. I never <laughs> talk about politics. In almost 12 years of pastoring this church, this is literally the first time. <laughs> but you can't live in silence and in regret. Did you know that in 2020, 
49% of people of faith did not vote. That's over 100 million people. Listen, listen to, li, the, don't miss this. I don't wanna hear one more person say our country's going to hell if they're not going to the polls. You be mad, be mad, be mad. All right, what up, be mad. Your vote matters because your voice matters. Don't be intimidated by an enemy who makes you feel uneducated. Can I just say this? I've been having this conversation with Pastor Sonny. Some of you are like, I hope Pastor Dallas preaches next week. Nope, it's not, <laughs> another home game. You're stuck with me. Don't bring your friends. Parental warning. <laughs> I'm just getting started. I've only got four minutes left today. I'm just saying. We've been talking about the fact that some of the most dumb sounding people we've ever met in our life are Christians at vote time. Boy, I don't vote. You know, I don't know what. I just, I don't know. I don't know it. Now, listen, I'm not endorsing a candidate. I'm not endorsing a, a, a party. I ain't even from America. I'm from Canada. I don't even know what the parties there are. I found out this week that British Columbia, they might not even, might as well not even vote. They got one party. Who are you running against? That's like you won the gold at the Olympics, but nobody else was running. <laughs> Looks cool on the shelf, but I'm just saying. So I'm not endorsing anything other than the fact that if you don't know what's going on, it's all public. Study. Listen, read, go beyond lip service. Don't believe what you heard on a blue channel or a red channel or whatever. It may, like just, you gotta do your work because your kids are counting on you. Your grandkids are counting on you. I don't want my future granddaughter sharing a bathroom with a full grown man, regardless of how he identifies. I want her to see one opposite thing and that's when she gets married is what I'm saying. I don't want it to end up by accident. She's in there being a kid and all of a sudden. So what I need to ask myself is who's running for office who will make sure that doesn't happen. Listen, you can get angry later or you can get active now. Now people are gonna be three years from now talking about, well, we shouldn't have blah, blah, blah. Well, who'd you vote for? Well, I didn't vote because, well, then shut up. You ain't got jackrabbit to say. You had something to say that day. You can mail it in, whatever, whatever. I'm telling you, I never talked about this in my whole life, ever. I don't even talk about this with my friends. But what I know is in November, we are in a spiritual fight. And I get it. This is uncomfortable. This is one of those things you don't want to hear and I don't want to talk about. And some of you are thinking that church isn't the place that we should talk about those things. But that is an age old lie of the enemy. It is an enemy who is trying to keep the word of God from coming from the house of God to the people of God. This is exactly the place that we should be talking about this stuff. Because life is not a spectator sport. We are at war and you are under attack. And the enemy is using temptation, condemnation and intimidation to keep us on the sidelines and out of the fight. But your marriages are worth the fight. Your kids are worth the fight. Your morality is worth the fight. Your purity, your sanity, your sanctity are worth the fight. So identify the temptation in your life, confess your failures and take authority over the spirit that is trying to intimidate you. How? by filling your mind with God's word and your mouth with prayer. And so I wonder, will you do this today? Will you fill your mind with God's word? And will you fill your mouth with prayer? I hope so, because this is not a test. You are under attack. Will you close your eyes all across this place? You are under attack. I wonder if you're here today and you say, uh, you're under attack and you have felt under attack your whole life. Uh, you've tried everything. You've tried every substance, you've tried every chemical, you've tried every relationship, you've been in every bed that there is to know, you've gambled, you've, you've done everything you can, prescriptions, every therapy, 
and nothing has worked. And here you are today. Something inside of you felt like it took root. You felt a flutter of hope. This is a room filled with people who were exactly where you were before Jesus. That 30 years ago in a football locker room, I gave my life to the only one who made this life work. And we wanna give you the opportunity to do that. In the church, we call it salvation, that you, you're a wreck and you feel like you need to be saved. And the Bible says that you have to do two things to get out of that state. Uh, you have to confess, you have to profess. Confess that you have unresolved sin in your life and then, and then profess with your mouth that you believe that Jesus can change that. And so we're gonna do two things here in just a moment. In, in just a moment, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm gonna ask for people to do two things. First is with nobody looking around, I'm gonna ask for people who say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with the Lord. I haven't surrendered my life fully to Him. I'm gonna ask you in just a moment to raise your hand and make eye contact with me. Once you make eye contact, you can put your hand down. That's your act of confession. Then secondly, I'm gonna say a few lines in a prayer that I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna ask everybody in here uh, to say what it is that I just said. And if you do that, and you mean those words in your heart, the Bible says that you will be saved. You'll have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, so with nobody looking around, if you're here and you say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I want one with nobody looking around, would you just raise your hand up and make eye contact with me? Thanks, 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 thanks. But I didn't miss anybody. Thanks. 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 Who that pole tried to hide you? Anybody else? I'm missing anybody? Going once, going twice. Thanks. Whew. I'm gonna ask everybody in here to say these words after me. Say, Jesus, I have sin in my life. I do not want it. Please take it. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Come into my heart change it. Make me like you. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Secondly, with every head bowed and every eye closed, um, I wonder if you're here and you say, I'm a believer. If you were to die in a wreck today, you know that you'd go to heaven and not hell, but you'd say, Sean, I have been giving in to a spirit of temptation or of condemnation or intimidation, and you are tired of it. And you say, I would love for you to pray for me. Would you pop your hand up if you're under any of those right now? Whew. Lord, we love you. Thank you that you cure all things, that by your stripes we are healed. The greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, that you have made us more than conquerors. And so for my friends in this place, whatever spirit has them in bondage, we break it right now in Jesus' name. The blood that is on our lives will be on their lives. By your stripes, they would be healed in Jesus' name. As we journey through life, we all have opportunities to be generous. Because you are generous with your time, talent, and resources, together we can be generous by creating engaging in-person experiences, live online services, and fresh virtual resources so that thousands of people on the 920 and beyond can experience the life-changing message of Jesus every single week. Your tithe and above and beyond giving of any amount make it possible to create above and beyond experiences that point to the generosity of God. Online giving is safe, simple, and secure. Reoccurring giving makes it even easier. Together, let's be generous.